Tyrannosaurus rex is easily one of the biggest, beefiest bipedal animals to ever live. Because of this, it is a good example of how adaptations and constraints of the anatomical traits and functionality of those traits operate at body sizes of several tons. In the scientific literature, there has been a lot of talk about how fast T-Rex and other large theropod dinosaurs could run, and this is a big part of how they lived and hunted as carnivores. But despite a century of research since Osborne's 1916 work on the anatomy of Tyrannosaur limbs, there is still no agreement on T-Rex's top speed, or on whether or not its huge body size prevented it from running at all. Until a 2017 paper, that is. Some qualitative or non-number-based anatomical studies, including some that did also use quantitative or number-based biomechanical methods, have suggested that large theropods like T. rex ran rather fast, up to 20 meters per second, and were very athletic in general. These studies suggest that the T-Rex's long slender limbs and large tail-based hip muscles were two of its most important adaptations that helped it move quickly. Tyrannosaurus is known for being extremely wide, chunky, and muscly, both in comparison to other tyrannosaurs and other dinosaurs in general. On the other hand, more direct and quantitative or number-based biomechanical approaches have favored either intermediate or much slower speeds for T-Rex, with the latter including the inability to reach true running gates in their range of predictions. Biomechanical approaches, with biomechanical referring to the study of the structure, function, and motion of the mechanical aspects of organisms, focus on the well-known scaling principles that show that animals with a larger body mass have less mobility because muscle mass scales isometrically, but muscle force, relative speed and contraction, and power scale with negative allometry. The isometric part means that as an animal body mass increases, mobility decreases. The allometry part means that as muscles get bigger, they get stronger. Biomechanical models include anatomical features like the length of the limbs that are used to make more traditional qualitative or non-numerical assessments. However, they also need those quantitative definitions for soft tissue parameters related to how mass is distributed and how muscles work. These parameters of dinosaur soft tissue are almost never found in fossils, so they have to be estimated indirectly. Most of the time, these parameters are given minimum and maximum limits based on data from real animals and or other computer models. But these methods give exceptionally large ranges for soft tissue parameters in dinosaurs, which means that estimates of performance like running speed are not perfectly accurate. So, biomechanical approaches are clearer and more direct because they consider all of the major anatomical and physiological factors that affect an animal's ability to run, but their use in paleontology is severely limited by the high levels of uncertainty that come with the lack of soft tissues. With that said, biomechanical models have given ranges of 5 to 15 meters per second or 11 to 33 miles per hour for Tyrannosaurus running speed. One solution is to find information in the shape of the bones that can be used to make biomechanical models less dependent on soft tissue for making predictions. 
Recent research has shown that something called bone loading can be used to improve the reconstruction of how fossil vertebrates moved by leaving out gates that put too much stress on the bones. This is good because too much mass could literally just snap all the bones in a skeleton. It provides a narrower framework to work with. It's likely that in many cases, the skeletons of terrestrial vertebrates are optimized for how well they move, so that the peak stresses caused by movement are only 25-50% to 50 of their breaking strength. This means that there is a safety factor of between 2 and 4 in place. There are notable exceptions where long bones are much stronger than needed, but in general, this trade-off between body mass and load-bearing ability seems to be a common anatomical adaptation found in both invertebrates and vertebrates. In previous simulations of running theropod dinosaurs, the bone load was not taken into account directly. The newer simulations, conducted in a 2017 study by William Sellers, Stuart Pond, Charlotte Brassey, Phil Manning, and Carl Bates, on the other hand, calculate the joint reaction forces, which can be used to directly estimate the bone load using the beam mechanic method. Figure 1 of the 2017 paper, this graph here, shows the results for Struthio camelus, the ostrich, and T. rex. The values for Struthio are easily within those predicted by safety factor analysis, but the values for T-Rex are likely to be higher than the yield strength for bone, which is approximately 200 megapascals. This is in line with more advanced results from ostrich finite element analysis, which show that this species has high safety factors that might be related to activities other than moving. But approaches based on joint reaction forces have two main problems. First of all, to accurately calculate the loads that are carried in life during high-speed locomotion, it is necessary to combine a large number of different force components from soft tissues, joints, interactions with ground types, and body segment accelerations, not just the joint reaction forces. Estimates can be made using quasi-static approaches, but virtual robotic approaches like multi-body dynamics or MBDA allow calculation of the entire dynamic loading environment, which can then be used to estimate bone loading through beam mechanics or other simulation approaches like finite element analysis or FEA. Second of all, it's important that all of the important conditions are included directly in the optimization goal. It is possible that the previous high values estimated for the T-Rex bone stress were because the genetic algorithm was only looking for the fastest possible gait. There may be gaits that are just a little bit slower, but put much less stress on the skeleton. If skeletal stress isn't taken into account when machine learning, these gaits could be missed. So, the 2017 study showed how predictive an integrated approach can be in paleontology by using MBDA, machine learning algorithms, and stress analysis to figure out how fast T-Rex could move at its fastest. Machine learning algorithms are used to create the patterns of muscle activation that allow an MBDA model of a T-Rex to move at its fastest possible speed, while keeping in mind certain skeletal safety factors by putting the two simulation systems together, which is called multiphysics simulation. Only solutions that meet all the criteria will be accepted. This should narrow the range of the predicted performance estimates. I think I used a lot of big words there, but I made sure to provide some definitions for some of those words. We don't absolutely need to understand each and every one of them, as we are not doing the work ourselves. It all boils down to the specifics of using machine software to recreate estimated parts of the Tyrannosaurus body, enough to create a more accurate model for testing the speed the animal was capable of attaining digitally, rather than on paper. Multi-Body Dynamics Approach, or MBDA from here on out, approaches to reconstructing how an animal moves requires building a model of the animal's linked segments based on how its bones look and how its muscles are thought to work. As seen in figure 2 of the paper, or this guy right here, 
The model used here was based on a 3D laser scan of BHI-3033, which was the numerical designation of Stan the Tyrannosaurus, before it was sold to the highest bidder. Thankfully, the specimen found a museum to call home, or the data in this study would be completely worthless scientifically. No one would be able to replicate it. The model was made up of 15 separate parts, including a single trunk segment, left and right thigh, shank, metatarsal, and foot segments for the back legs, and arm, forearm, and hand segments for the front limbs. All of the segments were connected by hinge joints that could only bend and stretch. This is a simplification made because the then current control system couldn't handle fully mobile limbs. However, since the main joint actions were likely to happen in the parasagittal plane, or any plane that separates the body into unequal right and left halves, the authors of the study didn't think this would change the predictions very much. The skeleton was used to figure out the positions and ranges of motion of the joints. On the skeletal model, the starting points, ending points, and paths of 58 hind limb muscles, 29 per limb, were mapped based on a comparison of hind limb muscles in related living species. In this simulation, the muscles of the forelimb were simplified because the forelimb was not thought to be an important part of locomotion. The muscle mass properties were estimated using a simplified pattern in which each muscle action, flexion, and extension and joint location, proximal or closer to the body, intermediate, and distal or further away from the body, is thought to have a certain percentage of the total body mass, based on calculations from a variety of living vertebrate animals. Since the simulation method doesn't care much about the actual muscle proportion, as long as there is enough muscle to power the movement, the total muscle mass was set to 50%, which was the highest plausible number. The lengths of muscle fibers and tendons were set based on how much each muscle tendon unit length changed over the range of motion that the joint allowed. This setting tunes the actions of the muscles and tendons so that they work at the most effective parts of their length versus tension curves. This reduces the effects of errors in moment arms and lines of action. The body mass was estimated from the minimum convex hull of the individual segments using a regression curve calculated from the combined comparative dataset. All that math babble gave a total body mass of 7,206 kilograms, 15,888 pounds, or about 8 tons, which is on the lower end of recent estimates from volumetric models of Tyrannosaurus. For the bone stress analysis, the long bones of the limbs were treated as irregular beams, and the mid-shaft loading was calculated. The load was calculated directly from the multi-body simulator by splitting each leg segment into two separate bodies that were connected by a fixed joint. Using the full dynamic model, which includes inertial forces as well as muscle forces and joint reaction forces, the simulator was then able to figure out both the linear forces and the rotational torques around this joint that didn't move. A full finite element analysis would have been better, but it would take too long to run on the computer used in this study, and previous work had shown that the average error in loading long bones is probably around 10%. Figure 3, this set of graphs, shows the results of changing the peak stress limits for bones on the parameters of the gait of Tyrannosaurus. A specifically shows the fastest speeds that could be reached using velocity versus stress limit. For the high stress limit conditions above 200 megapascals, the fastest speed reached was 7.7 .7 meters per second. If you lower the peak stress limit, this maximum speed doesn't change much until you drop it below the stress limit of 150 megapascals. At that point, the maximum speed drops rather quickly. This clearly shows that limiting the stress at high values has no effect on running speed, so the simulation is not stress limited in these conditions. At lower stress limits, however, the stress limit controls the maximum speed. This shows that at physiologically realistic peak stresses, the simulation is stress limited. Now, B shows how the horizontal speed and hip height are used to figure out the Froude number. In this case, the Froude number is a way to measure speed that takes into account body size. This makes it useful for comparing how fast different species can run. 
from this, we can see that the Froude number at 100 megapascals is 1, which is usually the upper limit for walking gates. C shows how far the model walked with each step. These are pretty close to the predicted Froude number it's based on, and they show a steady drop with speed as expected. Finally, D shows that the time it takes to go through a gate cycle is pretty stable in the simulations. Figure 4 of the paper shows the calculated peak stresses in the limb during the whole gait cycle, as well as the times when the foot is in contact with the ground. If you take a look at M through O, which are at high speeds, the stress in the mid-tarsus is clearly the highest, but the stress in all the long bones is pretty high as well. As expected, the most stress happens during the stance phase, and the fact that the highest and lowest stresses at any time are pretty similar shows that this stress is mostly caused by bending and not by compressive loading on the limb. It happens due to bones bending rather than the amount of mass putting stress on those bones. The foot contact timings back up the predictions from the Froude numbers that the higher speeds have a clear aerial phase and represent running while the slower speeds have no aerial phase and represent a grounded gait. The 400 megapascals and 800 megapascals limit cases are almost the same, and the peak stress does not reach 400 megapascals, showing again that stress is not a limiting factor in these cases. When people talk about walking and running on two feet, they usually mean two different things. The traditional definition is move forward by lifting and putting down each foot in turn, keeping one foot on the ground at all times. This means duty factors. Walking has a duty factor of more than 0.5, so there is a time when both feet are on the ground. Running, on the other hand, has a duty factor of less than 0.5, so there is a time when both feet are in the air. But a bipedal gait can also be defined by the changes in energy between kinetic and gravitational potential energy. This makes it possible to talk about hybrid gates like grounded running, in which the center of mass moves in a way that is typical of running, but the animal is able to do this without going into the air, which is a style of gait often seen in birds. Next, we have to move on to figure 5, which shows the horizontal speed of the simulation's center of mass, as well as its vertical height against time. Autocorrelation is a way to measure the difference in phase between the kinetic and gravitational potential energies. At the slowest speed, the phase difference between these two is 22%. At higher speeds, it drops to about 15%. As you might expect, this would mean that there is a moderate exchange of energy at low speeds. But figure 6 shows the simulation's actual horizontal kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, and it's easy to see that there isn't much room for energy recovery because the values are so different. When leg stress limits the simulation, the center of mass seems to move up and down as little as possible, so that very little gravitational potential energy is ever stored. So, the simulation isn't using the ways that pendulous walking saves energy. This could mean that grounded running is preferred, but it could mean that the model is optimized for maximum speed and not for minimum energy cost. In this case, ground running reduces leg stress while pendulous walking reduces energy cost. Figure 4's changes in speed show how the peak load is very different between walking and running gates. A lot of research on safety factors in ground running vertebrates shows that bone shouldn't be under more than 100 megapascals of stress most of the time. In the 2017 study simulations, fast walking causes stresses that are very close to what this prediction says will happen, as seen in figures 2 and 3. But all the simulations of real running gates show a big jump in the highest peak stresses that clearly goes over the highest value that can be allowed. When running, body accelerations are higher, and because the duty factor is lower, the force during the contact phase must also be higher. When walking, on the other hand, accelerations are lower and forces are lower because the duty factor is higher. Slow walking also allows for a longer double support phase, so that the load on the legs can be spread between both limbs. When all of these things work together, the peak load in aerial running goes up sharply, and based on the stress limits of living animals, the skeleton is not strong enough to handle this level of load. 
So even if safety factors below the lower limit seen in living animals is allowed, the analysis shows that T-Rex wasn't mechanically able to run. Previous quantitative or number-based estimates of T-Rex's absolute maximum speeds ranged from 5 to 15 meters per second, and soft tissue unknowns were cited as a major source of uncertainty. However, by including mechanical information about hard tissue, it can be shown that the highest values, while possible if given generous estimates for soft tissue, are impossible given the strength of the skeleton. The size of the skeleton directly affects how strong the bones are, and the analysis of T-Rex shows that the forces made by the muscles do not limit the top speed. When very high stresses are allowed in the model, above 150 megapascals and especially 400 to 800 megapascals, the predicted speeds are the same as the average estimates from previous models that only took into account how muscles limit maximum performance. Also, the analysis of energy transformations as seen in figures 4 and 5 supports the idea that the simulation is looking for ways to reduce the load on the skeleton and that low-impact, grounded running, like birds, might be a good gait for bipedal dinosaurs. As with all attempts to figure out how fossilized animals moved, it's important to be cautious with interpretations. These results are better than those from earlier biomechanical work because they leave out some of the plausible values and narrow the range of uncertainty. However, many of the caveats from earlier work still apply. In previous work on sensitivity analysis by the authors of the 2017 study, they looked at how body mass, the location of the center of mass, and different measures of muscle physiology affected the results. However, these complex models have a large number of other parameters that could change the predictions of the model. In an ideal world, a full Monte Carlo-style sensitivity analysis would be done to look at the effects of all of these parameters. However, a full Monte Carlo-style sensitivity analysis requires a lot of computing power, which was not available in 2017. They could also find out if their predictions are true by doing experiments with living animals. Direct bone strain measurement is a well-known method that has been used on a wide range of animals. Strains from multi-body dynamic analysis have also been checked against the scientific literature in a number of cases. However, it is clear that these two methods need to be used together in the same experimental system, and this would be a good way to go in the future. The models used in the simulations are the most anatomically complete reconstructions ever attempted, but they are still appreciable simplifications of how complicated living things really are. In particular, extending the stress analysis to a full finite element model would be very helpful, especially if it was combined with a more realistic muscle coverage, which could be done by dividing anatomical muscles into multiple functional units and adding other non-bone tissues. With these extra parts, the model might be able to take advantage of the possibility of reducing peak stress by using soft tissue tensile elements to make tensegrity structures, which might have a big effect, as has been suggested for other Tyrannosaurids. Lastly, the simulations use machine learning to find patterns of muscle activation that maximize speed given a set of limitations. An exhaustive search can't be done because there are too many possible combinations of parameters. Instead, the team needed to use a non-exhaustive method. This is a very active area of computer research, and better solutions will be found in the future using a combination of better algorithms and more powerful computers. The fact that T-Rex could only walk may support the idea that the largest two-legged dinosaurs, like T-Rex, lived less active lives. Tyrannosaurs went through big allometric changes as they grew, and studies have shown that as T-Rex grew, its torso got longer and heavier, while its limbs got proportionally shorter and lighter. Because of this, it would be very helpful to not only look into other species, but also use the multiphysics approach on different stages of growth within species. Ontogenetic niche partitioning has been suggested for many dinosaurs, especially in Tyrannosaurus, and changes in T-Rex's skull and the way it bit might show that as it got bigger, it ate more large prey and or dead animals. Such a shift towards specializing on large prey is not in conflict with what was found in this study about locomotor speed, since large herbivores that weighed several tons probably had the same general scaling-related limits on musculoskeletal performance as T-Rex. 
there seems to be direct evidence that T-Rex behaved like a predator, which supports the idea that predators and their prey had an effect on how fast they could move. It seems strange that the relatively long and flexible limbs of T-Rex, which have long been thought to show that it could run well, would have actually limited it to walking and walking very fast. This shows how analogies can only get you so far and how important a full biomechanical analysis is when studying animals with very different shapes, like the T-Rex. The new method described in the 2017 study has the potential to help us learn a lot about how animals moved over time, especially big changes like animals moving from water to land or from walking to running on all fours. The results show that the range of speeds predicted by earlier biomechanical models for how T-Rex moved include speeds that would have put more stress on the skeleton than it could have handled. So, these high load speeds can be left out of future predictions. This means that the possible range of maximum speeds has been greatly reduced and adults of this species can pretty much only walk. This finding could be true for other long-legged giants like Giganotosaurus, Mapusaurus, and Acrocanthosaurus, but this idea should be tested along with experimental work on living bipedal species. This work shows how including multiple physical modalities and multiple goals can help us figure out how ancient organisms moved and give us a better idea of the mechanical limits of having a big body. In the end, it turns out that Tyrannosaurus was a fast walker, not a speedy runner that bounced along after prey. This absolutely says nothing of how fast it was. It was still a super fast animal that could easily catch up to you or I. It just did it while power walking. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to Elephant Tier patrons Abby Smith, Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Cherry Shaw, Chris Frampton, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Ed Peretz, Isaiah Garza, Jax the Hacks, Natty Cat, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, and Extraterrestrial as well as my top as tier Tyrannosaurus patrons, Admin, Antron, Aphid Kirby, Cyber, Dana Manchester, Danny Van Heck, Henry Brennan, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Joshua Mana, Panic, Radio 404, Robert Kessler, Ruben Zachariah, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, and The Dogman.